Well, it's a real honor to be here and uh, delighted to be back at DUMC. We were all together in Manila for that great conference that Daniel referred to, a world conference on discipleship, and uh, actually Doris, uh, Daniel, and uh, my colleague Matt and I, who travels, Matt travels with me, we flew back together late last evening. I've been, I'm on a six-country trip, starting off in China and then in the Philippines and now here on Monday on to Indonesia and then to Singapore and on to the UK at Oxford to speak at a graduation there and then back home for three days and then on to Bangalore, India after that. So I was writing to somebody and they asked me, where are you? I said, just traveling till the Lord calls me home because that will be the nice last trip and I won't have to pack my suitcase again. But you know, one of the great thrills about traveling around the globe, and I don't say this lightly, and it's because your pastor Daniel introduced me as a friend, it's really that blessing you do have of building friendships. I've been an itinerant now for 41 years, and we've covered well over 70 plus countries, and to have friends all over the world is a wonderful thing, and Daniel and his wife Doris have just become very dear friends to me. I'm very grateful to the Lord for their friendship, their encouragement, and their affirmation as we travel. Uh, Doris, I consider that genius of one-liners. You know, we'll all be sitting around the table musing and philosophizing, and all of a sudden she'll just come out with one line that meant more than all of our other protracted paragraphs over the period of time that we chatted. So uh, always grateful for your contribution, Doris. It's wonderful to have that. Uh, nice to see how wonderful it is. You just come forward and put it into the box. That's great. I was at a conference uh, in um, Belgium years ago when uh, they were having a hard time meeting their budget. And so they asked Louis Palau to come and plead with the people and get the money in. And uh, Louis Palau said, there are two ways I can do this. I can do this the hard way or the simple way. And he looked at the audience and he said, I can make sure the budget is met if I do it the hard way and it'll only take me one minute. And they're all sitting forward and here's what he said. He said, this is what I'd ask you to do. Everybody stand up and then the person behind you leans forward and takes the wallet out of the pocket of the person in front of you. <laughs> and always give what you wanted to give but never did. Empty it out from the air. You could see everybody going for their wallet all of a sudden. And then he said, no, I'll do it the easier way and do it with a free will. Do you hear of the minister on a plane that got into trouble and was in heavy turbulence? They were afraid it was going to crash. And so the uh, one lady ran up to him and she said, Mr. Minister, Mr. Minister, would you please do something religious? So he stood up and took the offering. That's what people think of religious activity. But thank you for doing what you did. It's a remarkable expression of your love that will touch all across the world. Well, your pastor asked me to speak on a particular subject. And uh, so as I was reasoning with him and talking to him about it, I said, we'll do it some other time. And I hope we can. He feels it is important to address the subject of faith and reason how these two interact in the world of materialism and science, also with the world of spirituality and your commitment to transcendent notions of truth, and of course, ultimately, to God himself. So I hope we can do that sometime. Instead, I told him I'll take some subject that I hope will make this a worship experience for you and uh, drive you to answer a very important question. A few months ago, I heard quite a funny story coming out of India, and the story went this way. This guy had gone for an interview and for a job, and in, in, gen in India generally, when there's about uh, 10 positions available, about 5,000 will apply, and then they go through the exams, and then they do the interview and all of that. So this uh, group of young guys had been selected for the interview from whom the final bunch was going to be uh, approved uh, or designated as uh, uh, qualifying for the position. So this one guy goes for the interview and comes back, and as often happens in India, I wouldn't be surprised if it happens here too. One guy went up to him and said, uh, did he finish the interview? He said, yes. He said, what were the questions? What were the questions? He said, well, they told us that the questions are going to be identical for everybody, so not to dare share the questions with anybody. 
So he said, I'm not allowed to share the questions. He said, OK, don't, don't give me the questions. Just give me the answers. <laughs> so when the guy had gone in, the first question they'd asked him was, when did India get its independence? And this fellow said, you know, uh, it's not right to just spin one day when so many things took place, so many activities, so much action, so many meetings, so many discussions, so many legislations and negotiations and all. But it all finally came together in 1947. He said, oh, that's good. So then they asked him, what is the, who is the father of the nation? He said, you know, it's not fair to just pick one particular person. When there are so many people involved in this kind of thing, why do you just have to pin it on one person? Many people were involved in this, so that was his answer. So they said, the third question to you is this, is corruption India's major problem? And he, uh, he gave them the answer. He said, you know, the prime minister has appointed a committee and it's going to research all of this matter. And finally, after all of the research is done and they come to their conclusion, we'll have a definitive answer to your question. So they were very impressed with this young guy, but he went out and the fellow asked him what the questions were. He didn't tell him the questions, but he gave him the answers. So the second fellow walks in a little later and they look at him and they're going over the forms and the interviewing committee says to him, by the way, your form is not complete. What is your date of birth? And he says, you know, it's not right to just pick one day when there were so many days in negotiations and discussions and uh, dialogue and all this that went on. But finally, the date was in 1947. <laughs> so they look at him and said, really? He said, yeah, yeah. I said, what was your father's name? He said, you know, it's really not fair to pick one particular person as my father when there were so many people involved in this coming down the aisle and so on and so forth. So one of the interviewing men said, have you lost your head? He said, well, the prime minister has appointed a committee and uh, once the research is done, we'll be able to come out with a definitive answer. You know, in apologetics, it's very important not only to listen to the question, but also to the questioner. It is critical that when a question is raised, you answer it not only with the component of truth, which is indispensable, but with the fact of relevance, so that the answers stand on the twin feet of truthfulness and relevance. That is what the gospel is all about. It is built on truth and dispensed with relevance. It has a practical application for your life. It is not so theoretical, so abstract, so esoteric, so obtuse or way out in the clouds philosophically that it doesn't filter down into where you live by day to day, day to day. And so I want to take a simple question for you this evening. And I hope it will be meaningful. Obviously, one cannot uh, exhaustively deal with such a question, but I think one can meaningfully deal with it. And the question I want to answer tonight is, who is God? Who is God? Because once that term is defined and understood, then all of the other questions that you face and answers that are given are hung on the peg of the way you have answered this particular one. In my library books and my personal possessions, one of my favorite possessions is a 52-volume series called The Great Books of the Western World. It was compiled, I think, sometime in the 1950s, and the editor-in-chief of that was a Jewish philosopher by the name of Mortimer Adler, who actually became a later comer to Christ and was a tremendous author in many, many fields, uh, Ten Philosophical Mistakes and so on, a great uh, profound thinker in, in jurisprudence and so on. But here he was when he produced this book, 52 volumes. The first two volumes are called the Syntopicon. It was a contraction of two words, synthesis of topics. How you bring the topics together. And this is how it works. If you want to know, for example, what a great thinker like Plato said about justice, 
then you will turn to the syntopicon and you will look for the subject of, uh, of uh, justice and then you will see all of the bibliography on the other 50 volumes what Plato said about it, what Gibbon said about it, what Aristotle said about it or uh, any great writers like Dostoevsky in more recent times. So the synthesis of topics tells you where you will find one particular author on one particular subject. And the essays are given at the end of which you find more references. The longest essay is on God. They have subjects like history, philosophy, law. All of these important questions of Western philosophy are dealt with and the longest essay is on God. And Mortimer Adler, when he was being interviewed, I saw that interview, he was asked, why did you give the theme of God the greatest volume of space in your multiple volume set? Mortimer Adler's answer was in one line. Here's what he said, because more consequences for life follow from that one issue than any other issue you can think of. You hear what he said? In your life, how you view God has the most direct and exhaustive bearing on what else you believe and how you live. So this subject of God is an extraordinary theme. You already either have an answer to it or you're looking for an answer to it. The great British expositor Charles Haddon Spurgeon made this comment. He says, the proper study of the Christian is the Godhead. It is the highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can engage the attention of a child of God. It is the name, the nature, the person, the doings, and the existence of this great God. There is something exceedingly improving to the mind in the contemplation of divinity. It is a subject so vast that all our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. Other subjects we can comprehend and grapple with. In them we feel a kind of self-contentment and go on our way with the thought, behold, I am wise. But when I come to this master science, finding that our plumb line cannot sound its depth and that our eagle eye cannot see its height, we turn away with the thought, I am but of yesterday and know nothing. Powerful statement from a great biblical expositor. There's a great prayer in the Old Testament. You can just make a note of it. You can look at it in detail when you get back to your rooms. Second Chronicles 20, and it is a war that is looming, and King Jehoshaphat says the problem is too daunting. We don't have an army big enough for this. And like many people in history, when you face an army bigger than yourself, you resort to getting on your knees before God. Many of you may recall in studying history the great war that came upon Russia when Napoleon was invading them. You know, the Tsar in Russia at that time had purposely appointed a hedonist for the archbishop, a man who didn't really believe in God. And the Tsar wanted to have that kind of a person supporting him in all that he did. And yet, as Napoleon's army was closing in in Mon Moscow, and the spires of Moscow were burning, Tsar Alexander Pavlovich knew exactly what the problem would be. And the Tsar went into the church in St. Petersburg and fell on his knees before God and prayed and begged him to protect his nation. And as one writer says it, God answered by sending a minor, minor prophet the winter. And Napoleon's armies were stopped. You know, it's ironic that when Marxism took over in Russia, they converted that church into a museum of atheism. They had forgotten that their own leader fell on his face before God in that very church to plead for its protection. So here is Jehoshaphat facing this army. I just want to take three questions in his prayer. 
Normally, prayer deals with pleas. Here the plea is prefaced in an inter interrogative form. Here it is, it comes to us in chapter 2 Chronicles 20, verse 6. And he said in his prayer, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? In verse 7, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before us? And verse 12, will you not judge them as this enemy comes upon us? Are you not? Did you not? Will you not? In these three questions, I want to answer for you who God is in biblical terms. First question, are you not? How do you answer that? If you were given a sheet of paper and asked to fill in the blanks, who is God? What would you say? Are you not dot, 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 dot? I was mentioning to an audience recently when I was doing my doctrinal examination after my graduate work for my denomination in the United States, they told us that the answers needed to be brief and you could not consult anything but the Bible in your answers. So I spread out the sheet. It was going to be a protracted thing. I could stay in my apartment where I was a student at that time. And the first question was, God is perfect. Explain. I said, what? So I turned to my wife and said, the only more difficult question I could think of would be to say, define God and give two examples. God is perfect. Explain. Fortunately, it was this smaller space in which to do the explaining because I think the longer the explanation, the greater the possibility of heresy. So I answered in one line. He's the only entity in existence, the reason for whose existence is in himself. Every other entity in this world has the reason for their existence outside of themselves. So in that sense, God is a perfect being. He is uncaused, undependent. The reason for his existence is in himself. For all of us, the reason for his existence is outside of ourselves. I didn't hear back, so I assumed it was okay. Who is God? You know, if you talk to people purely on the basis of feelings and experience, you'll get a diversity of answers. Many years ago, Life magazine had on its front cover a marvelous picture of the heavens, and in big white letters it said, Who is God? And they started to interview. We answer most questions in America with surveys. And if the people like the surveys, then the answer is held. If they don't like the surveys, it doesn't really matter whether what you believe is true or not. So in this survey, they went around asking people, who is God? And one woman talked about the fact that she found God to be her healer, her redeemer. She had lived and known Christ for all her life and in her senior years had contracted cancer, and she told a beautiful story of how she'd found Christ to be that sustaining source and strength. The next answer was from a minister of the gospel. He testified to the fact that he'd lived a duplicitous life and that he contracted some dreadful disease and was now living with AIDS, and as duplicitous as he'd been, now in his years, suffering in his body, he said, I have found what a forgiving God I have, and even though I've lost so much in the process, his grace and his forgiveness is in my heart, and I treasure the grace of Christ and my forgiveness. As you were reading this, your heart was deeply moved. And then they came to one person who said, I don't believe God is a person at all. God is really an idea. A fourth person said, man, God has not created man, man has created God. And then the editor himself said, it all depends on whichever realm of spirituality you actually want to believe in, it's okay for you. What do you conclude at the end of that? That if you only go on the basis of an emotional, some kind of existential response, you will come out with a variety of different answers and you never know which one is actually true. Experience is an important thing, but it ought not to be the final arbiter of what it is that is ultimately true. 
That's why we have a revealed word of God and a propositional word. If you remember the apostle Peter, Peter was given one of the greatest experiences ever given to the human eye. Peter, James, and John walked up to the Mount of Transfiguration and saw the body of Christ transfigured. So profound was that experience, he didn't want to go down from the mountain. And what is it, what is it? He said, let's pitch some tents and let's stay on here. And Christ told them to go back into the places where people needed to hear. This, Peter says in his epistle, we ourselves were eyewitnesses to his majesty, but now we have a more sure word of prophecy. He went beyond the experience to the word of God, which was written propositionally true. So if you come to experience, you don't really have a, a, a coalescing answer. If you come to go then to the philosophers, you begin to find out most of their arguments you don't even understand. I'm a philosophy major. It was reading philosophy that made me a prayer warrior because I didn't understand most of what these people were saying. My professor of philosophy, Dr. Norman Geisler, who got his PhD from Chicago, he's written volumes and volumes of books he was my professor when I studied in Chicago, and his wife Barbara has quite a sense of humor. She edits all his book. He had finished one 5,000-page manuscript, just one book, 5,000 pages. I don't know if I know enough to write 5,000 pages. And his wife looked at him and said, Norm, tell me the truth. I promise I will never tell it to anybody else. Do even you understand what you have said here? Do even you understand what you have said here? Because it climbs the ladder of concepts where most people do not comprehend. I find it utterly fascinating that when Jesus was asked to give an illustration of the kingdom of heaven, he did not go to a philosopher. He did not go to a high intellect. He took a little child and placed a child in the middle and said, of such is the kingdom of heaven, and unless you become as one of these, neither will you enter that kingdom. Powerful, absolutely powerful. I don't think God is glorifying ignorance. He's just glorifying the simple and the sublime and the teachable spirit that he wants you and me to have. If you go to experience, you get a diversity of answers. You go to philosophy, you get a diversity of answers. So then you go to theologians, and what do you get? You get some wonderful stuff, but you get some pretty big words as well. God is sovereign. God is holy. God is omni omniscient. God is immutable. All these words, God is holy. God is sovereign. God is omnipotent. God is immutable. God is omniscient. He knows everything. All of these things are really wonderful to know. But let me ask you something. Do they always bring you the answer that you really want at times that are most critical? I remember reading an essay, an, an article in an Italian newspaper when I was traveling there once. And it is a story of this truck driver who lived a life of no boundaries morally. Every city he went to, he would visit the brothels and so on. This is a front page story. And so on one of his trips back to Rome, he was stopping outside a brothel, a brothel he'd never been in. But somebody told him there was a wonderful new person in there who would cater to his needs, and that next time he was there, he should go there. That he'd been there, visited this particular person as her client, and he said, you should go there sometime. This was a true story on the front pages of the paper in Rome. So the guy is making his journey back and he stops outside this brothel and he pays the money and he goes into the room waiting for this woman to come. When the door opens, to his utter shock and horror, he finds out it's his wife. And the paper said he nearly strangled her to death as she yelled and screamed and, had to, and then was rescued. And I thought to myself, incredible, isn't it? It was okay for him. 
but not okay for her. You see, we are very comfortable when we can use holiness to judge others. We are very uncomfortable when that same holiness judges us. And here we've got Almighty God who is pure in His judgment and holy in His character. And there are times where you and I are terrified where because He knows everything, because He is all-powerful, and because He is holy, that you and I will have to stand before Him. These are truths, but these are truths that come to us in a troubling way that we are not sure how to incorporate. So you've got the emotional side, you've got the intellectual side, you've got the revelational and propositional side. So now we come to the most important disclosure of all. I want you to understand and listen to me very carefully, ladies and gentlemen. This is critical. This is critical in understanding what the Christian worldview is all about. Think of the Apostle Paul, who was a Hebrew by birth, who was a citizen of Rome and who had studied in a Greek city, Tarsus. Hebrew by birth, citizen of Rome, studied in a Greek city. The three great cultures of his time. The Hebrews gave to us our, uh, our, our moral categories. The Romans gave to the West their legal categories. And when you think of Greece, they gave to the West their philosophical categories, moral categories, legal categories, and uh, ultimately the philosophical categories. The Hebrews, the Greeks, the Romans, that shaped the Western world. The Apostle Paul was a product of the three. If you'd gone to a Hebrew person to ask him for a metaphor of that which was quintessentially ultimate, you know what they would have said? Light. Light is that ultimate metaphor. That's why they say uh, that the people who sat in darkness had seen a great light. The Lord is my light and my salvation. For the Hebrews, light was the ultimate. For the Greeks, it was knowledge. They're the ones who created the universities. If you go to Greek universities today that once stood and see the pillars that are fallen, you will still see the words episteme, which is the word to know. They wanted to know. For the Hebrews, light. For the Greeks, knowledge. For the Romans, glory. The glory of the Roman Empire. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. God, who caused the light to shine out of darkness, has caused his light to shine in our hearts, to give to us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Light, knowledge, and glory in a face. What do you think of that? When I was growing up in Delhi, I know many of you probably speak Tamil, because some of you look like me. <laughs> Although my mother was Tamilian, my father was Keralite, I was raised in Delhi, so I'm to Delhi. I come from Delhi, I speak Hindi. Tamil and so, with this, we had a servant called Arumagam. You know, you know what that means in Tamil. Six faces, Arumagam. Arumagam was a wonderful, loyal servant for many, many years. He had never been to a movie. And one day my mother said, we'll buy you a ticket, it's your birthday, we'll let you go and see a movie. He was, oh, he was so excited about it. So he puts on his best shirt, his best trousers, puts on his shoes, polishes them. My mother gave him the money and he's walking over to the stadium, the cinema in Delhi, to buy a ticket and see it. And he lost his way and he got in late. And when he came back, we asked him, how was it? He said, ayo, yo, yo, yo. He goes on to describe what happened. He says he got in late and he went in through the middle door. And he said, I didn't know the whole room was dark, black. And I was looking at a wall and all I saw was light beams coming out of the back wall. And he thought, why have I paid money to see these light beams coming out of the back wall? And all of a sudden he hears the voice and people are telling him to sit down and he turns around and he looks at a screen. And he lets out a scream when he sees the faces on the screen. He thought he'd paid to go and see the beams till he could see the face on the screen. Many, many systems of thought 
may have a beam sending you in a certain direction. When you come to Christ, you see the face, the full expression, the unique expression of the Godhead who offers himself to be your Savior, the very Son of God. Who are you, God? When you see that he is the expression of the light and the knowledge and the glory, here is the point. Take a look at this face in the garden when he's praying for you and for me. And what does he say? Three times he refers to God as Holy Father, Holy Father, Holy Father. I've been telling the story for some years of a young man who lives not far from where we live in Atlanta. As a matter of fact, he lives very close to our home now. The first time I read this letter, I didn't even know who he was, but his grandfather gave me this because this boy was only 12 years old when this happened. The year was 1989. His father's name was Greg Simmons. A lot of people knew about Greg Simmons. He was a huge success in the business world. He had five children. The oldest was 12, McKittrick. The youngest was a babe in arms. And he bought a beautiful property not far from Atlanta, Georgia, in Highlands, North Carolina, which is an Edenic setting. He bought this home in Highlands just to have another home, and a home they could visit on weekends or maybe even retire in. So this 41-year-old magnet, his wife's name is Christy Simmons. His oldest boy, McKittrick, 12, says, Dad, can I come and see that home? We haven't seen it. So he took four of his kids, oldest 12, youngest three, left the babe in arms with his wife and took another friend of his, and I think a friend's son or somebody. So they all journeyed on, not a long drive, a few hours to Highlands, and they're walking around the property and the kids are just loving it. And then the son says, Dad, there's a waterfall here, right? He said, yeah. He said, can we see the waterfall? So the father takes all of them. And as he's approaching towards the waterfall, he puts his arm out and says, stay right here, because I've never walked up to this, this close to it. Let me make sure it's safe for all of you to come. So he starts taking one, two, three, and about third or fourth step. The soil underneath was very soft, and it couldn't hold him anymore. And he came cartwheeling a quarter of a mile to his death. And this 12-year-old son and his other three children and his friend and son saw Greg Simmons tumble down to his death. This little boy wrote a letter to a family friend by the name of Whelans. The Whelan family is also quite prominent in Atlanta. He's a big builder. And here's a 12-year-old boy writing to Mrs. Whelan. Dear Mrs. Whelan, you don't know how much your family has helped produce my father. He admired your husband and you a lot. He would talk about how good and strong your faith was with God. He tried to be very generous, as you all have been to the church and to many other things. Since his death, the true friends have been revealed. Your family is at the top of our list. You know, Miss Wieland, you are a great source of energy for my mother and I. My father loved you very much and was always trying to be like you. My father was like one of the three men in the Bible who were given the talents by Jesus. One went out and invested them and multiplied them. One took some stock that failed and came out with nothing. The last one buried them and did nothing with them. All of them returned in a few days and the Lord was pleased with the two who had tried to multiply them. But with the third man who had come back with the same amount, the Lord was disappointed because he didn't even try. My father multiplied and lost many things, but he was always trying to please the Lord. He got that from your family. My dad was a risk taker. That's just how he was. Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning is God. That was the most important thing for my father. In the beginning of my dad's life, he was something special and a risk taker. That's why he was so brilliant and successful. Miss Whelan, no one will understand how or why my daddy fell into the waterfall. Please do yourself a favor and don't try to figure it out. My daddy died for his children. He was making sure it was safe for us to come. You may hear different things, but only six people saw it, and only three understand or understood what really happened that day. I am one of those. My mom has lost her treasure chest, her husband. Most of the others have lost Greg. You have lost a best friend. My grandparents have lost their son. Forrest, John, and Barbara have lost their brother. But Miss Wieland, it is very different for me totally different for me because he was my best friend and my idol. 
when I got my last glimpse of him falling down the falls, I lost my most prized man on earth. He was my father. He was my one and only dad. I had a dream three nights ago, but it wasn't a dream. My daddy's all right. He told me himself, thank you for being a true friend. I love you a lot. Gregory McKittrick McKittrick Simmons. Twelve-year-old boy who knew what it was to love his father and the pain of losing a father. I know some of you well enough in this audience to know at least one family that has experienced that. I was talking to some, an audience in China last week. Uh, my mother died when I was in my twenties. and. Uh, her birthday is on May the 19th, and that was her birthday as I was thinking about it, speaking on that day. You never get over losing a parent who has truly loved you and given themselves to you. Imagine being in a creation, in a world where there is no father, no one who loves you to really take care of your well-being. Who is God? He is your holy Father. Holy in the distance, Father in his proximity to care for you and love you and to be protective of you. I go into some dangerous situations in the world. Somebody asked me once how I pack for every trip. And I'll be honest with you. One of the things I pack for is the contingency that all kinds of things may happen that may extend my trip, for which I may not be able to return home. So we are back. But I always pack with the certainty that I'm in God's hands. Always pack with that, that I am totally secure in the comfort of His protection. We've been through some harrowing experiences in life. Harrowing experiences. I'll never forget in the 1980s, my wife was about 15 feet away from me, terrified by what was happening. Moscow had become a totally lawless city. And in the dead of winter, as I was walking to speak at an engagement, and the military general walking about 10 steps ahead of me, and I paused to take a look at some building my wife also had, and a man totally bare-bodied till his waist, with a huge machete in his hand, mad as anything waving this machete, waving this knife, and he comes and stands one feet in front of me, brandishing this knife, staring at me eyeball to eyeball. What do you do? You do the only thing you know, dear Jesus. Stand right here with me. Stand right here with me. I'm sure my brother Daniel will tell you the same thing, his wife Doris, any one of you who travels the world in these matters or carries on a high-risk situation. You can be certain of one thing, that if you know your Lord, He is the heavenly Father who will guide and guard and stop your steps. He's your Holy Father. That's who God is. He's not an idea. He's not merely an emotional component. He's not just a philosophical argument. He's not just a propositional revelation. He's a very being who's fashioned you in his image. If you know that, once you know that, deep in your heart, you are dealing with the person of the living God who is your Holy Father. Are you not? Secondly and quickly, did you not? Did you not protect us in the last battle? Did you not rescue us the last time when we were facing this? You know, ladies and gentlemen, it is very important in your experience to have that time where you remember the moment of your commitment to Him. That you may, it doesn't have to be the day and the time for everybody, but it has to be a moment that you know in your heart you've turned your life over completely to Him. Did you not rescue me at that point? When we were in Manila this last week, my colleagues who were with me, 
Um, Matt was there with me at that time, and a prominent personality stood up at a gathering and in a question-answer time and basically said he'd blown it, blown it big time, and was living now with all kinds of total meaninglessness. And he wanted to know what my answer would be to him. And uh, having come to Christ myself on a bed of suicide, when any young person stands up and voices things like that, I take a very serious note of that question. And I gave him the answer. And the next morning, he writes an email to us and has picked up this relationship and friendship now. And he says, my answer is going to have to be, I suppose, in total surrender. He's right. That's one of the things I said to him. Until you're totally surrendered to Christ, you will always live with this gray zone of not knowing what life is actually all about. So I'm asking you this, have you given yourself to him completely? Can you look back and say, I did that at such and such a time? One of the most powerful stories Reader's Digest ever told was a story called, it happened on the Brooklyn subway. It happened on the Brooklyn subway. I'll give you this and move to my final thought and I'll promise to keep that brief. It's a story of a man who went into a certain train every day in New York on his way to work. But one of his friends was critically ill and rather than enter into that train, he got onto another one going in the opposite direction. And in the middle of the day on the Brooklyn subway, he took another train to go back to work. He'd never been on that train at that hour of the day ever. And as he got into the train, it was very crowded because it was lunch hour and he didn't know if he would get any room, but he had to make it to work. And as he squeezed himself and one man sitting there suddenly realized this was his stop and he jumped out and uh, took off. And so this man by the name of Marcel Sternberger, who writes the story, plunked himself into that one spot. But he said, the man sitting next to me was very inconsiderate. He was reading a newspaper like this, arms wide. And he said, there's hardly any room. He said, but then I noticed he was reading a Polish newspaper, and I can read Polish, he said. So he started reading with him, and he noticed he was reading the classified ads. So he says to the man, are you looking for a job? He said in Polish, and he looked at him, he said, no, I'm not. He said, but I see you're reading classified ads. He said, actually, I'm looking for my wife. He said, oh, you're looking for a wife in a newspaper? He said, no, no, no. He said, my name is Bella Paskin. I lived in Debrecen in Hungary during the war. When I was taken away to the Soviet Union to bury the, the dead, and when I went there, by the time I came back, the Germans had launched their assault, taken most of them in Debrecen into Auschwitz. And by the time I returned, my wife was gone. I didn't know where to find her, but the, but the allies had come in and delivered and rescued even those from Auschwitz. I was hoping my wife was among them and that somehow she was brought to America. And so I have come to America and all I'm doing is reading the newspapers every day, placing an ad to see if I could find my wife. And Marcel Sternberger said, what is your wife's name? He said, my wife's name is Maria Paskin. Sternberger remembered he'd been at a gathering some nights before and the woman sitting next to him at this gathering was a woman from Debrecen whose name was Maria Paskin. She said her husband was taken over and the story and then he said, you know, you and I can get together sometime. Give me your phone number. I'll call you sometime. So I'd written, he'd written her name, put it in a piece of paper and into his wallet. So he covertly takes out the wallet and sees if that piece of paper is still there, and it was. So he says to Marcet, he says to, Mar to, to, uh, to Bella Paskin, get off this train with me at the next station. I want to see if I can do something for you. So Sternberger gets off with Bella Paskin, and they go over to a telephone booth, and he tells Bella Paskin, stand a few feet away, please. I need to make a phone call. So this Sternberger starts dialing the phone and a voice picks it up, hello, a woman's voice, and he says, who am I speaking to? And she says, this is Maria, he says, do you remember me? My name is Marcel Sternberger. She said, yes, yes, I remember meeting you. He said, can you tell me what your husband's name was? She says, my husband was Bella Paskin. He said, Maria, you are about to witness a miracle. 
And he takes the phone and gives it to Bella Paskin, who comes and picks it up. And all he starts saying is, after he says hello, he sobs and sobs and sobs uncontrollably. Sternberger gets him into the right place to deliver him to her wife. And you know, to his wife, here's the way the news, the article ends in Reader's Digest. Brilliant. It says this, Skeptical persons will no doubt attribute the events of that memorable afternoon to mere chance. But was it chance that made Sternberger suddenly decide to visit his sick friend and hence take a subway line that he had never been on before? Was it chance that caused the man sitting by the door of the car to rush out just as Sternberger came in? Was it chance that caused Bella Paskin to be sitting beside Sternberger reading, it's not Polish, my mistake, Hungarian, reading a Hungarian newspaper? Was it chance or did God ride the Brooklyn subway that afternoon? Did God ride the Brooklyn subway that afternoon? So here's this Hungarian couple from Debrecen. He's reading a Hungarian newspaper. Sternberger sits behind him, beside him, ultimately bringing husband and wife together, separated for many, many years. Was it chance or did God ride the Brooklyn subway that afternoon? I have a question for you. Do you think it's chance that has brought you here today? Do you think you're here by accident? Or do you think God has ordered your steps? Maybe you didn't want to come, some friend just dragged you along. Do you think you came here by accident? I want to tell you, when God intervenes in your life, you will remember and you will say, did you not? Did you not? I came to Christ on a bed of suicide. I'm a Christian philosopher. I engage in argument after argument after argument, hopefully legitimately. But I'll tell you what, the most powerful argument in my own mind is the day I was 17 and for the first time a Bible was read to me and I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I met him in that hospital bed in New Delhi. Some of you may know the name. The name of that man was Fred David. He's director of Delhi Youth for Christ. The only reason I mention it is Fred David passed away a couple months ago in California. I spoke to him a few days before he died. His daughter's name is Tammy. She phoned me and said, Uncle Ravi, you know what dad does every day? He sits down in so much of pain, but he turns on the television and most of the day he just watches you on YouTube. And I called Fred, you know, the first question he said to me was, can I help you, can I do anything for you? I said, I'm fine, Fred. And here's what he said to me. He said, you know, Ravi, sometimes I think God brought me into this world just to bring that Bible to you. You're my Timothy, he said. I said this at Princeton University and I didn't know his daughter Tammy was listening. She wrote and asked if she could put it as a memorial to her father on the website after he passed away. Did you not meet me at Wellington Hospital, Lord Jesus, when I was 17 years old? Have you met him? Do you know him? You can. You can. Are you not my Holy Father? Did you not deliver me? And he says, will you not? Will you not lead us in this warfare and protect us? Who is God? He is the God of the past. He is the God of the present. He is the God of the future. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is our Holy Father who gave his Son for you for your redemption and your salvation and has promised to take you into his presence when your life on this earth has ended. That's who God is. And your heart will be restless until you find your rest in him. You know, uh, I want to tell you the truth. Probably shouldn't say it this way, but even coming from where I did, I was asked to stay on long before the date came to speak out there, but I came here. 
something in my heart that was such the last time I came and spoke here, watching your young people lead in worship, music, and all of that. I came here on my way to Indonesia. And what I want to say to you is, I believe God guides our steps this way. He takes us into the future. And I know whenever my last breath is breathed, it'll be by divine appointment that that moment has come. And I just pray that I will be ready to meet him when that moment finally comes. Will you not, will you not protect me way out into the future? And so I close this message and say to you, the hope that God gives to you and gives to me is that he provides for you and me care over the past, over the present and the future. My book, The Grand Weaver, I make this statement. The older you get, the more you see the design. The younger you are, the more you see the wrong side of the design. You wonder if there's a design. But the older you get, the more you see the right side of the design. I had a rough youth. I had a youth that failed repeatedly. But I do know this much. Everything that God allowed to happen, he allowed to happen for a purpose. And I'm just grateful he never gave up on me. And he won't give up on you either. I want to close with this illustration. Before I close, I want to say this to you personally. Are you troubled tonight? Are you unsure about the future? Is something really on your mind that builds you with fear or uncertainty? Or are you racked by the past? I don't know. In an audience like this, there have to be people like that. But I believe if God's brought you, brought you here on purpose, he's brought you here to meet you and to talk to you and to have an encounter with you. There's a parable told some time ago which I think is powerful. You may have heard it. If not, for some of you at least, it'll be the first time. There's a man who lived in a rich man's home. His father was very wealthy. Not only did his father have a lot of things, but his father had one of the greatest art collections anywhere in the globe, personal ones. And this son of his was a choice young man. He would go along the streets and he would often see a particular beggar that he really grew friendly with and would chat with the beggar. And the beggar would say, what is it like living in the home of a rich man and so on. And so the son would talk to him about the art gallery and all of that. And the beggar would just, you know, wistfully think about it. And so one day when the young man came, the beggar said to him, you know, I, I like to draw too. I'm not very good, but I have drawn a portrait of you because I like you very much. And maybe your father will hang this up in his portrait gallery. So he had drawn this picture and gave it to the son. And the son, not wanting to hurt him, said, I'll make sure I take it home. And the beggar gave him the piece of art and left it. Some years went by and the son stopped coming. And one day, one week, two weeks, three weeks, he never saw the son again. So he made his way to this rich man's home and the watchman was standing out there and he said, there used to be a young man here who often visited me. He doesn't come anymore. He said, oh, the young man passed away. He said, oh, I didn't know that. He said, yeah, in, uh, I'm sorry, he said, yes, he said, the young man passed away. He said, oh, that's, that's uh, unfortunate, I didn't know that. And some days went by, he found out the father passed away as well. And then he heard a rumor that the art was going to be auctioned. And so a lot of people were coming to the home, this beggar put on some of his best clothes and snuck in there. He only had one goal in mind. And he wanted to see if his picture was also going to be there. So he got in, and he's looking at the gallery and all of that, and sure enough, the picture he'd drawn of the sun is hanging there, didn't compare to the rest. And the auctioneer starts off by saying, before we proceed, the father left in his will one condition. This portrait of his son was the first thing to be auctioned. And the people moaned and groaned and thought, what on earth? So he put it up for bidding and nobody bid and the beggar put his hand in his pocket, found a few coins and put that out and said, I offer this much for that paint, for that picture. And nobody competed, the gavel was pounded and he said, sold to this beggar. So the beggar goes, takes it up and he's about to leave when he says, nobody leave please. There was a second condition in the will. 
the father left this, whoever bought the portrait of the son gets the entire art gallery. Parable? Yes. Does it have a lot of truth laden in it? Yes. When you get the sun, you get the full riches of the Father and what he has given to you and to me. Do you know his son? Have you received the Savior?